So hi everyone and welcome to our ninth revolutionizing healthcare session. Um, this is a roundtable on decision support tools powered by AI and machine learning. Uh, my name is Nick Maxfield. I handle the Van der Schaar Labs communications and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm also joined by Mihaila van der Schaar and by one of our postdocs, Ahmed Allah, who will be giving presentations today and by a panel of five clinicians who have kindly volunteered their time to join us for a roundtable. So to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session, our purpose as always with revolutionizing healthcare is to build a shared community and to develop a common language between ML and healthcare. We do this by defining and understanding medical problems through the use of formalisms and by mapping these to AI and machine learning solutions. Our previous session was a roundtable on personalized therapeutics and individualized treatment effects. And if you haven't seen this yet, I definitely recommend having a look at our YouTube channel or on our website, um, because there's definitely a lot there worth seeing. Um, and this time around, we have, as I mentioned, a roundtable on decision support tools powered by AI and machine learning, chief among which is Adutorium, which we'll introduce in just a minute. Um, to break this down for you time-wise, after my introduction, we'll have a brief presentation by Mihaila, who will be giving an overview. Um, that'll be about 15 minutes in total. And then we'll have two short presentations by Ahmed Allah, um, who's one of our lab's postdocs. And these will be about basically how Adutorium works and what we can use to do with Adutorium. Um, and then we'll go into sort of the meat of the session, which is our roundtable with panelists on selected topics. So basically building on our presentations, um, there will be a number of selected topics that Rehaila will ask to our panelists, and this will take roughly about 30 minutes in total. If we do have time at the end, uh, we'll also have an open Q&A discussion with uh, you, our audience. Um, if you do have any questions for either Mihaila or our panelists, please post them into the Zoom chat throughout the session. Please don't message us individually, though. Please post them to everyone so we can all see it. Um, and these don't need to be just asked during the Q&A. Actually, um, they can be asked at any point during the session. And actually, earlier is better because we may be able to incorporate them into the roundtable itself. We would, however, like to restrict ourselves to questions from practicing clinicians, if at all possible, uh, because you are our target audience. Uh, we plan to wrap up at about quarter past. So I'd like to introduce our um, panel of clinicians for today's roundtable. Uh, we have five clinicians with us today, and I'd like to thank them very much for giving their time. Uh, first, we have Adrian Harris, who's a professor of medical oncology at the University of Oxford, uh, where he's also a consultant medical oncologist at the Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. We have Dirk Timmerman, who's a professor in obstetrics and gynaecology at KU Leuven. And he's also a visiting professor at Imperial College London. We have Jem Rashbas, who's formerly executive director for data and analytical services at NHS Digital and national director for disease registration and cancer analysis at Public Health England. We also have with us Kelly McCann, um, who's actually a returning uh, member of Revolutionizing Healthcare. You will have seen her before, maybe. Um, she's a practicing hematologist oncologist at UCLA, and she's also a member of the Translational Oncology Research Lab at Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. And we have with us Sileni Han, who's a gynecologist oncology oncologist at UC Leuven and assistant professor in the Faculty of Medicine at KU Leuven. Uh, before we get into the presentations and roundtable, I do need to read a very quick disclaimer to um, which is about the fact that we can now offer continuing professional development credits or CPD credits um, under the, uh, uh, the Royal College of Physicians scheme for UK based clinicians. And that's one uh, credit per session for participating in these sessions, whether they're live or whether they're on YouTube. Uh, but to do so, I need to make a short disclaimer to the effect that this is a non-commercial, no fee event organized by our lab independently from our research sponsors, that we don't have any conflicts of interest, such as financial relationships that would undermine the balance, objectivity or scientific rigor of these sessions, and that we won't use these sessions to promote products or services that if our research sponsors are mentioned, it will be strictly relevant to the session's academic content and will acknowledge sponsorship when such a mention is made. Um, if you do want to know how to claim credits for this session, I will let you know about how to do that at the end of this session. So please bear with us for that. Anyway, without further ado, um, next up we have our presentation by Mihaila, which as I mentioned will be about 15 minutes, she'll be doing it live. Um, and if you do have any questions during this time, um, please post them into the Zoom chat. Um, so, Mihaila, if you want to go ahead and share your screen over mine. So, thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining us, and especially to the five clinicians that have kindly volunteered their time to, to join us in this discussion today. Um, really, this session is about the main goal 
to some extent of revolutionizing healthcare, empowering clinicians with actionable intelligence using machine learning that is interpretable. And um, I'd like to start by um, again quoting uh, William Osler, which I have quoted as a beginning of this journey on revolutionizing healthcare in our Revolutionizing Healthcare One. Um, where he's saying that if it were not for the great variability between individuals, medicine might as well be a science, not an art. And at the time, we were discussing the complexity of patients which have different genetic background, uh, environmental exposures, lifestyles, histories, and interventions, which of course lead to different risks, variation in symptoms, health and disease trajectories, as well as responses to treatment. And at the time, we discussed about the fact that, of course, medicine is an art because it requires you, the clinicians, to make judgments on the basis of a wealth of information, diverse information, to manage patients. And this journey is about collaborating with you to develop machine learning methods that can turn medicine from art to science and build actionable intelligence that can empower you. Um, again, one of the early discussions that we had in revolutionizing healthcare were among the fact that we, a patient may often have multiple risks over time. And the current approach to this is often to assess one risk at a time and independently. So uh, when a patient may see a clinician um, in general practice may often be assessed for just one risk. But ideally, you would like to develop um, a holistic view of patient health, both for patients that have not been diagnosed with any disease or for patients that already have been diagnosed with a particular disease and maybe of risk of a variety of other conditions. So how to build um, a holistic view of the patient where we have many risk scores that are developed, um, that are trustworthy and actionable. So how can machine learning help? Well, we have many diseases. We have, today we are going to talk a lot about cancer and breast cancer in particular, but the reality is that we have many different types of diseases. There are different types of variables and features of the patient that may play a role. And also one may want to develop uh, risk prediction models for a variety of needs. And both the patient's characteristics as well as these needs may be changing over time. And a brute force approach to this problem is often ineffective, uh, both because the tools that may be used may be suboptimal as well as uh, the expertise may be needed. So what we have discussed in a prior session in revolutionizing healthcare was the use of automated machine learning tools to make machine learning do the crafting of such risk scores. And Ahmed is going to talk more about that in his presentation. But again, the advantage of AutoML is that it can craft and select machine learning models, inclusively tune the parameters of these models effectively. It can deal with missing data, but it can also enable us to identify what information is relevant for what prediction and for what subpopulation. Also, we may be able to evaluate the performance of these methods using diverse types of metrics. And this is something that I'm going to try to discuss with you and understand better what you think is needed in the later part of our roundtable. Also, um, machine learning models can come up with uncertainty estimates associated with the prediction, such that we know when we can trust the machine learning model and when we cannot. And uncertainty estimation is another topic that I would like to bring into the roundtable discussion today. Yet another is the interpretability of the machine learning models. So we have built Autoprognosis a few years back, Ahmed and I, which is a tool for crafting clinical scores at scale. It can use clinical data and build entire pipelines for prediction, uh, imputation, feature processing, classification, and calibration. It can also learn from other complementary cohorts, either in other hospitals or in other healthcare systems. And it issues not only predictions, but also explanations. The way it issues explanations is through the use of symbolic meta-models, 
we have discussed in a previous revolutionizing healthcare a variety of ways in which we can come up with interpretability of black box models, including symbolic meta models, but not only that. And we have had a roundtable discussion together with clinicians where we discover an entire different ecosystem of ways in which we need to interpret black box models. I invite you to take a look and get in touch if you are interested in that agenda. In the system that uh, Ahmed is going to present, initially when we trained the model uh, autoprognosis, we were comparing it with methods such as state-of-the-art um, currently used predict, and we were only focusing on the prediction performance. But since then, we have advanced the agenda and developed a variety of methods to understand this type of predictions and which can be used um, for interpretation. And Ahmed will talk more about that. One thing that uh, we are not going to discuss in length today, but I'd like to say, to mention that this is an important part of the machine learning ecosystem and of the AutoML uh, framework that we have developed, is the fact that we can identify the value of information and the value of modeling. What do I mean by that? We can, for instance, take a um, complex data set with a variety of information like UK Biobank and try to develop risk scores for a particular disease. For instance, like we have done a few years back with collaborators in Cambridge for cardiovascular disease, we have built, um, also using autoprognosis, a predicting prediction method for CVD events on the basis of UK Biobank. And at that time, we have used 473 variables uh, that were included in this risk prediction. What is interesting, though, is we wondered after that, as part of this analysis, what variables were truly informative and for what subclass of patients, which represents the value of information. A second question that we ask is how important it is to depart from statistical models, uh, linear models, um, such as regressions, and move to nonlinear interactions as identified by and used by machine learning models. So we are having the ability within tools like Adjutorium to estimate the modeling gain. So how much performance improvement we have by using a nonlinear machine learning model as opposed to a linear model, such as a Cox model, as well as information gain, what will happen if we uh, use a certain number of hand-selected variables based on the clinician knowledge as opposed to all the variables? And we can identify what variables are most representative and for which subclass of patients. And indeed, in the evaluation of cardiovascular disease, we, we saw that while for the diabetic patients, the performance improvements were huge, um, for the general population, uh, they were less. So what is interesting here is it may be that while for the general population, uh, collecting a wealth of information may not be needed for a subclass of patients that may be extremely valuable. So we need to include more, var more variables and also the value of modeling because there may be nonlinear interactions in the subclass of patients that is truly powerful and useful. Um, finally, I'd like to say that while today we focus on autoprognosis and adjutorium, we have built also AutoML tools for other settings, inclusively survival analysis, competing risk, causal models, and temporal models. So we have a wealth of tools that can um, empower you. And also I'd like to say that autoprognosis, while today we are going to focus it in the context of uh, breast cancer, we have looked at it in cardiovascular disease, cystic fibrosis, as well as on COVID-19. Um, finally, while today we are going to highlight some of the aspects of these tools, I'd like to mention other advantages as well. One is the fact that this type of AutoML tools are fast in deployment that can be easily used by data scientists or clinicians to build their own scores. They are open source. So unlike startups that are arising nowadays, which are building proprietary software, our software um, for the tool like Adjutorium are open source. Um, 
Also, we can easily build risks for many diseases and many purposes. We can assess the value of information by identifying what's the value of adding a particular variable or set of variables for this particular risk. We can provide various types of interpretability. We can discover different types of nonlinear interactions that have been deemed to be important for this particular prediction. Methods can come not only with p-values, but also through uncertainty estimates associated with them. Also, we often may have a, a particular risk score that was trained in one population, but we would like to transfer it into another population, either in another country or in an other type of setting. And we have a, an ecosystem of tools that are able to do that. And finally, Patients are changing over time. We can clearly see that in the case of COVID-19, where the type of patients are affected by the disease is changing, but also clinical practice is changing. So an advantage of such AutoML tools is that it can enable us to do continuous learning such that we don't need to wait for data scientists like Ahmed and me to build a new score, but rather enable us to do automated retraining every time the data is changing. So hopefully these are some food for thought that would put the discussion in context. And I'd like now to give the, the floor to Ahmed to go into the details of Adjutorium. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, next up, we have two short presentations by Ahmed, who's one of our postdocs. Um, collectively, these are about 20 minutes in total. And um, again, if you do have any questions, please post them into the Zoom chat during the presentations. It's absolutely fine. Um, so the first of these is basically kind of a little bit about how Adutorium can be used. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a demonstration for the Adutorium breast cancer prognostication tool. Uh, in this demonstration, I will show you what the Adutorium tool does and how to use it. Uh, through an exemplary patient. So this tool is meant for predicting um, prognosis for, patient, for breast cancer patients who underwent a surgery and for whom we want to see what adjuvant therapies we should uh, give them and what would be the expected benefits of these therapies. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, the patient information and the therapy options. And on the right-hand side, we have the prognosis. So I will enter the information for an exemplary patient. So the first piece of information we want, we need to enter is the age at diagnosis. Uh, I will enter a 75 year old patient who has a tumor size of 20 millimeters and five uh, lymph nodes to which the cancer has spread. Uh, the next piece of information we need to enter are a set of discrete uh, options. Uh, for the tumor grade, we have three different tumor grades. I will enter a grade two tumor. And then the means by which the tumor was detected, whether it was detected symptomatically or through a routine screening. Uh, so here I will enter symptoms. And then we have the estrogen receptor status. Uh, we have ER negative patients and ER positive patients. Um, I will look at an example for an ER positive patient who has a HER2 status that's also positive. And then for this patient, we can see on the right-hand side the survival profile over 10 years. What are the chances of this patient surviving um, one year and two year up to 10 years uh, post-surgery compared to the survival of the population of patients in the same demographic who has no breast cancer. Um, so as you can see, this is the survival profile just with surgery, but we can also see the treatment benefit uh, for different types of treatment. So we have two treatment options in the current version of Agitorium, chemotherapy and hormone therapy. So if we want to see what, what's the effect and the benefit of chemotherapy, we can uh, select the chemotherapy on the left-hand side here. Uh, as, so as you can see, if the patient is given chemotherapy, there is an improvement uh, in the prognosis, this is the pink curve. This is the survival with chemotherapy. And the blue curve is the survival just with surgery. And uh, we can see the 
a numerical value for the survival ben benefit for a different number of years. If we select a five-year horizon, we can see the improvement uh, in survival probabilities uh, at this horizon. If we select a 10-year horizon, we can also see the uh, the improvement in survival by percentage at this time horizon. Uh, and there is a textual explanation for this prediction that's shown to the patient. So uh, what this means is that for every 100 patients with features similar to this patient, 38 will survive with surgery alone, 37 will lie due to breast cancer, and 25 will lie due to other causes. And five extra patients uh, would survive due to thanks to chemotherapy. Uh, so in case the patient cannot read the survival curve, this is a textual explanation for what this what the prognosis means. We can also add the hormone therapy option on the left-hand side. And as you can see, using hormone therapy, we further improve uh, the patient's survival. So this patient will clearly benefit from a combination of hormone therapy and chemotherapy. But that's only because this patient uh, is an ER status positive patient for whom hormone therapy would be uh, efficacious. But if we have an ER negative patient, which is a usually a more uh, severe prognosis for this kind of patients, uh, hormone therapy would not really have any benefit. So for this patients, typically we just administer chemotherapy. And again, for this, for this kind of patients, we uh, visualize the improvement in survival based on chemotherapy alone. Um, and in this case, we, we can also select the different time horizons for which we can visualize the chemotherapy treatment benefit. Uh, there are many other options uh, that we can toggle to see how prognosis differs for different kinds of patients. So uh, the younger the patient gets, if we can toggle this panel, we get better and better uh, prognosis uh, just because of the fact that uh, as the patient gets younger, the other cause survival uh, probability uh, uh, gets smaller and smaller, uh, sorry, gets larger and larger. So this uh, panel depicts the old cause survival. That's, that is the survival due to breast cancer or, or other causes. So it's not just breast cancer survival. The effect of tumor size can also be uh, visualized. So as we increase the tumor size, we definitely get worse prognosis. As we increase the number of lymph nodes to which the cancer has spread, we definitely get worse prognosis. Uh, and the same for uh, tumor grade and the different subtypes of breast cancer in terms of estrogen receptor status and HER2 status. So thank you for listening. I hope you try out this tool and provide us with feedback and also participate in the discussion that will follow uh, our presentation. Thank you again for listening. Okay, and um, just a quick note, actually, if you do want to give that tool a go, you can just have a look on our website. Um, we do have a recent announcement um, on this topic, and that leads to a link where you can actually um, try this out on the web app, as Ahmed just displayed. Um, so Ahmed, second video is kind of a, a technical overview, more of how Agitorium works um, from a relatively high level. So now that we have demonstrated how the Agitorium application works, uh, in the following presentation, I will be providing a very brief technical overview of how the model was derived. And uh, you can find the details of model derivation in our Nature Machine Intelligence paper, which is a joint work with Dipti Gordesani, Adrian Harris, and Jem Rashbas. So as I mentioned before, Agitorium is meant for early breast cancer patients who underwent a surgery. So typically a woman would be diagnosed with breast cancer through a routine screening process in which she takes a mammogram or an MRI or an ultrasound screening followed by a biopsy, which confirms the diagnosis. And then the patient would undergo a surgery in which the tumor is removed. Afterwards, we need to decide which uh, adjuvant therapy the patient should be given. And we have multiple options for adjuvant therapies. In this study, we're just looking at chemotherapy and hormone therapy. And at this point of time, that's when the Agitorium tool becomes relevant for clinical decision-making. Uh, so Agitorium was derived through data for almost 1 million breast cancer patients in the US and the UK. Uh, the two data sources that we used for our study were the NCARAS, uh, the National Cancer Registration Analysis Service in the UK, which is a data set 
uh, held by Public Health England, and the SEER data set, which is a national cancer registry in the US. Uh, this is an open access data set. Um, so all the data that in both data sets that were included in the study had to be the uh, most recent 10 years of diagnosis. Uh, so these are the patients uh, that were diagnosed in the past 10 years uh, and that are most representative of current patient outcomes because as we know, uh, breast cancer outcomes are improving over the years. So we wanted our tool to be um, as relevant as possible to the current advances in, in therapy and, and the current improvements in patient outcomes. All patients included in the study had to be between 30 and 90 years of age. Uh, and we removed uh, patient records that had outlier values for tumor size and number of lymph nodes uh, involved and patients with excessive uh, missingness in their uh, prognostic factors. So after applying the inclusion criteria from the UK data set, uh, we ended up with 400,000 patients and the same, roughly the same number of patients, uh, actually 369,584 uh, thousand patients um, were included in our study. So um, both cohorts are roughly the same size, almost half a million patients. And we use the, uh, as I show later, as I will show later, we use the UK data for model derivation, internal validation, and then we use the SEER data set for external validation. So the prognostic variables that we included in the model are based on existing literature. So we looked at what prognostic factors are confirmed to be predictive of outcomes in previous works. And we extracted these variables from the two data sets. So these included the age of diagnosis, the mode of detection, whether it's clinical or through a screen, routine screening process, uh, the estrogen receptor status, uh, the HER2 status, the tumor size, and the number of lymph nodes to which the cancer has spread and the tumor grade. Um, and the treatment options that we considered are chemotherapy and hormone therapy. And the time of prediction is normally after surgery. And this is usually one month or so after uh, the initial diagnosis that the patient would receive. So we used 80% of the UK data, the NCRAS uh, data set for model development. Uh, this is 316,000 patients. And then we used 20% of the same data set for internal validation. Uh, so this would be around 80,000 patients. And then we used the entire US data for external validation. So that's uh, 369,000 patients. Uh, the two data sets are not exactly the same in terms of patient distributions, uh, the distribution of patient characteristics and uh, the outcomes. So we, we noticed that the US had slightly better prognostic outcomes and also different characteristics for each of these prognostic variables. So in terms of the average age, the number of lymph nodes and so on, we have not, not exactly the same distribution. So testing the model on this external data set will kind of show its robustness to uh, slide distribution shifts. And this is, this is a test for whether the model developed from the UK data can actually be used in other countries. So as a baseline and to show how uh, the model, our model performs compared to existing models uh, on both the internal and the external validation data sets, we consider three different baselines. The first is the Nottingham prognostic index. Uh, this is a very simple risk score that linearly combines a uh, few prognostic factors. So we look at uh, the values of the tumor size, um, the uh, number of lymph nodes to which the cancer has spread and tumor grade. And then we discretize these uh, values into different ranges. And then we combine these discrete values into one risk score. That's the NPI or Nottingham prognostic index. Uh, another uh, model is the predict score, which is um, sort of a Cox-based regression model um, that has uh, separate models for ER positive and ER negative patients, and then uses fractional polynomial regression for the different continuous variables in, uh, in the prognostic factors to model non-linearity non in risk. Uh, so age is modeled non-linearly, tumor size is modeled non-linearly, number of lymph nodes is also modeled non-linearly, and we have a separate models for uh, the ER positive and ER negative patients, as these patients have drastically different prognosis. 
so this is a very popular risk score. Um, many people are using it. So that's a very uh, good baseline to compare with. Uh, another baseline that we considered is um, and because the, the other two baselines are derived from different data sets, we also wanted to see whether our machine learning model, which I will describe later, is improving over standard like statistical models on the same data set uh, that we use for model derivation. So we considered a, a Cox proportion hazards model uh, that models age non-linearly and has a separate co set of coefficients for ER negative and ER positive patients. And we derived this model using the same 316,000 uh, patient data uh, included in, the, in our model derivation cohort. So our model is based on an automated machine learning system that uh, we developed earlier uh, that we call autoprognosis and that we have used to develop risk scores for various other diseases, including cardiovascular diseases and, and cystic fibrosis. So the key idea of autoprognosis is to, to create an ensemble of machine learning models. Each of them are finely tuned for the data set at hand uh, using a method called Bayesian optimization. So instead of uh, manually selecting which machine learning model to use for uh, the data set at hand, we automatically create an ensemble of the best machine learning models that fit uh, the current data set. And um, the way the model is developed for this kind of survival and prediction setup is that we discretize the patient outcomes for 10 years. So we assign them binary uh, labels of mortality or surviving at, at each time step for 10 uh, years post-surgery. And uh, then we fit a binary classification model for each time step. This gives us some sort of a non-parametric survival curve. Uh, and then we fit uh, a, 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 an automatically generated nonlinear survival formula to the model predictions in a post hoc fashion. So we don't just use the binary, the raw binary predictions to create a survival curve, but then we try to match this non-parametric binary survival curve uh, predicted by the machine learning model uh, with a parametric formula for, uh, for the survival curve for each patient. And then we use this parametric formula uh, to predict survival in the interface of Agitorium. Uh, so it's very hard or honestly impossible to predict, to uh, estimate treatment effects from this observation data that we have in uh, CIR and NCRAS, uh, just because there is a very strong selection bias. So the patients who are receiving chemotherapy and hormone therapy have different characteristics than patients who are receiving uh, chemotherapy alone or patients who are not receiving treatments at all. Uh, so it's very hard to estimate the effects of the treatments um, on the basis of the observational data. So to uh, solve this problem, we used uh, the results from meta-analysis by the early breast, uh, early breast cancer trialist collaborative group at Oxford University. They have uh, two meta-analyses in Lancet, one published in 2005 and one published in 2012. Uh, that estimated the hazard ratios for chemotherapy and hormone therapy um, in um, uh, using multiple clinical trials. So we used the, these results uh, to, and incorporate them in our model. So we fix the treatment effects in our training procedure and then estimate the baseline prognosis of the untreated patients accordingly. So how does our model perform compared to uh, th these three baselines. So as we can see in the internal validation cohort, we looked at the concordance index to evaluate survival accuracy of survival predictions. We also looked at area under receiver operating characteristic curve or AUC to evaluate the accuracy of the binary classification predictions. And in terms of both metrics, our model outperforms the three baselines for uh, different time horizons. So the very short term one year prediction, five year predictions, and then the 10 year predictions uh, the discriminative accuracy of our model, uh, which is the ability of the model to distinguish between high risk and low risk patients is much higher than the existing models. And the same holds for the completely unseen external validation data set that untouched by our model. Uh, we can also see that uh, the agitatory model based on auto prognosis uh, performs much better um, on the external validation cohort than the existing models. 
So this means that uh, if we are to use one of these models for US patients, uh, all of them are derived from UK data, it's better to use our model. It's generalized better to the US population. Uh, the last thing that I want to discuss is the value of using the automated machine learning approach that we have used. So uh, here I'm plotting the predict performance as this horizontal st straight line, the dotted line, in terms of AUCROC for uh, five-year predictions. Uh, and as you can see on the x-axis, we have very different machine learning models and their performances. And what we can observe here is that not all machine learning models would outperform the existing baselines. Some would outperform the baseline, some would not. And so that's where the value of automating the modeling choices for machine learning comes into play. And that's what autoprognosis does. It creates an ensemble of the best possible machine learning models that work well for this data set at hand uh, without overfitting because the way the Bayesian optimization works is that it does cross validation. And then we check that it doesn't overfit by testing the model on the internal validation cohort and also in an entirely unseen external validation cohort that comes from a very different population. So thank you so much for listening. We are very eager to uh, have a discussion with you about our model uh, and how this and how can we improve it uh, going forward. Thank you so much. Okay, so now it's time for our round table. And as I mentioned, we have uh, five clinicians who generously given their time to be with us today. Um, Adrian Harris, Dirk Timmerman, Jen Rashbaz, Kelly McCann, and Sileni Han. Um, I think Dirk may have to leave us about 20 minutes in, um, but that still gives us plenty of time with him, thankfully. Um, so the way this is going to work is basically, um, we have kind of three broad topics and each of these contains a number of questions and Mihail is gonna ask our panelists these questions. And so we'll kick it to maybe one or two panelists to get things started um, and then maybe come back to the next question um, and just proceed that way. Um, so Mihail, I'm going to just show the first question if you wouldn't mind reading that out and then choosing someone to answer it, that would be great. Yes, thank you. So a first question that I'd like to ask you, the panelists, is how could we see, how could you see yourself using a tool like Adjutorium in practice? And how often do you encounter situations where such a machine learning tool could be particularly useful to you in decision as a decision support tool because you may be uncertain potentially about what exactly you should be doing. And I'd like to uh, address these two questions to uh, Kelly and Sileni because they are the ones that are seeing often patients uh, with breast cancer, I guess. Sure. Who wants to so, go first? Go ahead. Go ahead, Sorry. So I was going to say that um, I, I treat breast cancer almost exclusively for the, the HER2 positives and the triple negatives. I actually use neoadjuvant therapy most of the time because I need to see the tumor respond. And then I change the prognosis depending on what the, 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 the treatment response is. So if you have a triple negative, you treat her with chemo and she has a complete response. She doesn't need adjuvant therapy beyond that. So I mostly use this type of tool, like the PREDICT tool, in the case of an ER positive patient who could benefit from chemotherapy, but it's, it's always going to be a smaller benefit than somebody who has a HER2 positive or a triple negative breast cancer. I also use it a lot in the context of trying to convince a patient that systemic therapy is valuable because the surgeon always says they got it all and then they get radiation therapy and, and just trying to convince somebody she's at risk for metastasis and at risk for death is, is quite difficult sometimes. So that's how I use it. Thank you very much. Sileni? Um, well, thank you for inviting me to the round table. I'm really excited to hear about your work um, because one of the most important questions that a patient with breast cancer has is asking, what is my prognosis? How does my future look like? Um, so having a new way to answer it properly will be um, really exciting. And uh, just like Kelly says, we use it uh, quite often for the hormone receptor positive group, which is of course the largest group of breast cancer patients. And um, we try to use PREDICT at the moment 
to see how much are they in the gray area, thinking about chemotherapy and also thinking about the gene panels. Um, we use mama print uh, here in Belgium uh, that's reimbursed um, and then decide further based on the mama print result. Um, so now that I'm hearing that you're building this tool, um, would it be a possibility to incorporate the gene panel results um, that you can um, do a pop-up and say, please do the gene panel, um, mama print or Oncodite DX. And um, can you then um, put in the results of that so that you can see how does your prognosis change based on the gene panel results? Um, Definitely. This would be a fantastic collaboration in the making. So definitely, yeah. Ahmed and I are excited to, to, to be doing that. Well, I, I think so, that would really be a, a bonus. Um, so maybe we can collect multiple of you as subsequent collaborators. Nick, yeah. would you mind going to the next question? So thank you, Kelly and Seleni. So the next question is, what are kinds of cancer that especially would require support from a tool like Adjutorium? And how about applications beyond cancer? And I thought about asking these questions to Dirk in particular, because he is often looking at multiple settings and multiple diseases. So Thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I really enjoyed it uh, very much as well. And I think uh, this is really open to many applications. And I've been playing during the lectures with the tool. Uh, it's on my other screen. And it's really visually very appealing because you immediately see the effect of different uh, features, but also the different um, um, conditions of the patient. And I think, uh, of course, I'm much more in diagnosis and prognosis of, of errant tumors. And I think the ovary is uh, certainly a, a very good candidate to, to do this, but also for endometrial cancers, uh, where you also have different grades and uh, uh, possible adjuvant treatments. So I think in all oncology, uh, oncological conditions, you can apply this. Um, I had one small question about improvement because um, there's automated, automated retraining. And my question, is this always better? Because um, of course, if you have massive amount of data of patients, then you, you should believe that it becomes better. But if it's only a limited group of uh, patients, then it might be that the new group is a bit biased and that the automated retraining is not necessarily better you have any theoretical uh, response for this? Yeah, so, so um, maybe, maybe, Ahmed, maybe I let you uh, answer that. Why don't you take that question? Yeah, I think the decision of when to update a model should be based on two things. So one is just domain knowledge of in, an introduction of a new therapy, something that has changed in the system that requires us to collect new data, even if it's, uh, it's not that much. The second part of the decision is whether uh, the new data it changes the, the basic structure of the old model. And we, have, we already have developed uh, a follow-up for our automated machine learning system uh, that we call lifelong learning, where we keep collecting data over time, and then we keep updating our posterior beliefs on how the prediction, how much the predictions would change for individual patients, and then decide whether the model should be updated or not. So the automated machine learning system that we used here is just like a one-shot thing that we fit on the data set that we have, but we also have an extension over time. And you can think of this as a hypothesis test where we test the hypothesis that the model parameters has changed significantly. So it's it, this process itself has to be automated and there are algorithms that we use to do so. Uh, there's no fixed interval where we are like periodically updating the model. 
Thank you, Ahmed. And finally, I'm going to add one final thing, and maybe then we can go to the next question. So, so Dirk, in addition, what I think it's interesting, and you kind of alluded to, and I think that's part of the research agenda, is when we have populations that are very different. So, for instance, we collect data from different countries, potentially from Asia, where patients may have different types of morbidity, comorbidities, and genetic characteristics. How to aggregate these data sets? Again, we have as a community, the machine learning community and our group in particular, has looked a lot at building tools that can use very diverse populations with different factors and different um, features that may be differently informative and also where the clinical practice may be different because in these different countries, the practice may be different. And we have ways to transfer information and to transfer learning where we aggregate the right information from another country to empower the analysis in a specific country. But maybe we should take that to a subsequent revolutionizing healthcare and we should discuss things like that because I think they are interesting and we need your input. Thank you. Nick, would you mind going to the next one? So the next one has been touched a little bit upon by, um, by uh, Sileni, but I think that may be good to ask that anyway. So what additional information should be incorporated into Adjutorium and how, for example, would you hope to see genetic information incorporated and how it, could we work around the fact that such infor information may be at times absent? And I thought about asking this to, to, to Adrian and to, to, to Kelly. Uh, for me, I think that uh, one of the most important things to incorporate is menop menopausal status. It's going to make a, a huge difference in whether or not somebody's overall survival is affected because we're going to treat them differently. So for a premenopausal patient at high risk for recurrence, we're going to probably put her on ovarian suppression and an aromatase inhibitor instead of just tamoxifen. They also tend to benefit more from chemotherapy. And that might be because we push them into menopause and take away that estrogen source, but they might also benefit because the, the cancer biology with an estrogen source for an ER positive tumor is gonna be dividing a little bit faster, maybe even more responsive to chemo. So that would be one thing I would include. In the US, we use a lot of Oncotype DX, but that's uh, only for ER positive tumors predominantly. I only use it on my women typically who have no lymph nodes positive. So there's really, really uh, on the border cases where they might not benefit. And so that's when it's, it's most helpful to me is, is not to overtreat somebody um, in the early stage estrogen receptor positive um, category. Yeah, I agree with that, Kelly. Um, I also think of the elderly population, which isn't really that elderly anymore, 65 or older. When I was in medical school, over 60 was geriatric. So I think uh, there's more and more patients get at over 65 who are going to have the breast cancer and the role of chemotherapy there. And I think uh, they're often fairly fit. So if you undertreat people, they're going to lose, say, 10 or 20 years of survival, because if you get to 70, you'd expect to live to 80 these days. So I think the more accuracy for the older age group is very important not to undertreat them or to overtreat them. So I think that's one category. I uh, also uh, think that concomitant morbidities, we usually record that at the surgical meetings, and that's taken into account and is recorded centrally. So that if you could use a score for that, which there are many, that might help adjust the figures. That's a, th a further point worth making. And I think it's not quite sophisticated enough in the chemotherapy because for some elderly patients, you might only use what's called second line or second generation therapy. Whereas for the younger patients, you use third generation. There's really a clear difference between them. There will also soon be a, probably a, a, an approver for one of the CDK4-6 inhibitors as well. Mm -hmm. So for a, an elderly person who might not tolerate chemo, I might put her on an aromatase inhibitor plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which doubled the time until uh, for progression-free survival in the metastatic setting. So there are going to be some, some treatment options that totally exclude chemo and that are not represented yet. I think this is true also for Herceptin. So uh, for patients whose tumor is less than half a centimeter, there may be very little benefit. Uh, you know, great cost if you use it. Um, 
And I think that this uh, question that someone already raised was the, was your, you did, the response to new adjuvant therapy. Now, before they have new adjuvant therapy, you've got the prognosis. But, and we know that they have a complete response that's better, but there's no algorithm that brings together the final stage reduction. So if the nose didn't change, but the tumor did, or if it's a partial response, and that would be really interesting because we've got all that data, but we actually don't use it and overall, apart from using capsetabine, if they don't have a complete response. Right. So great. So we are going to then to be able to build maybe new tools to, to, to allow for this type of differential analysis and also for different competing risks Hmm. and evaluate the, the different treatments with respect to all of that. Let me move then to the next part on trustworthiness, robustness, and ease of use. So um, I'd like to ask, how important do you think it is to validate tools like this using cohorts from two or more countries? And would this increase your trust in the model? And I'd like to ask this to, to, to Jem, um, first, who has looked at um, cancer registries from multiple countries and has built multiple registries. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, I, I think it's, it is very challenging. The more data used, the better. And being able to demonstrate across jurisdictions and different countries, I think, is also fundamental. There's a lot of challenge, particularly across different jurisdictions, of we do things differently here. And the power of being able to show with one model that you can use different populations, different outcomes, and rapidly shows us how valid our treatments and processes are across different jurisdictions. Otherwise, there's a lot of skepticism um, about, you know, are we comparing like for like? I think the biggest challenge we all face, though, is also in numbers, particularly when we're interested in new therapies and new outcomes. And the challenge is that there just aren't enough cases, even in relatively large populations. You know, we have a population base in the UK or in England of 56 million. But by the time you've subfractionated that by mutation analyses, treatment options, age of patients, you're down to relatively small numbers. And the power of being able to have a model that can combine data sets from across countries and begin to get values earlier in the cycle is hugely important. Because, of course, we know that we're very successful in treating these conditions. So we need quite long-term follow-up. So with new therapies, we're really struggling to get enough data into the, into the system. And in some ways, that's the beauty of this particular approach, is that you get the results from relatively small numbers as quickly as possible, and you can use multiple jurisdictions. And the transfer learning in that, I think, is extremely valuable. Thank you so much. Nick, maybe. Um, so, so this is a question, I would say, to everyone seeing patients on a regular basis. So how do you find the way we present information in Adjutorium Intuitive? And is the info interface easy to read and where it could be improved? And Dirk, since you were mentioning that you were just uh, playing with it, maybe you can say something about it and maybe Seleni can as well. Well, it's extremely intuitive and um, it's visually very attractive, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, so I think it's very clear and I was wondering whether we could extend the timeline from 10 years, but uh, that's not possible. But uh, I think it may be good because otherwise it would be very depressing because you have the dotted line on top, which is the survival of all courses. And of course, accidents happen and other diseases happen. And then you see the difference with the survival because of breast cancer. So that's... Uh, uh, that's too different. So I think this is also very nice because otherwise the age is very important. If you presented first a, a patient of uh, 90 years old or 75, then of course survival of all uh, conditions is already a bit limited. Whereas in a younger patient, survival of all uh, causes is uh, much better. And I think this is good that you show these two on the same graph so that you can uh, e uh, immediately see the effect of breast cancer on survival uh, rates of this patient group and the other causes. So I think uh, visually it's perfect. I, I have no uh, improvements to, to suggest. 
Thank you. Sileni, do you have any other suggestions maybe? Um, I agree visually, yes, that it's uh, quite clear. Um, if it might be possible to also be able to print the results, but those are of course minor details for later um, to give to the patients and maybe the layman's terms so that the patient can uh, read the information at home. Um, that will really benefit um, the program. Thank you. Kelly, do you want to add anything? I 100% agree with a pretty printout because I, I give that to patients. A lot of them don't make the decision that day in clinic. They need to go home, discuss it. Patients are often, they're still working. Maybe they're still taking care of kids. They need to kind of figure out the chemotherapy aspect from a lot of different uh, lifestyle situations, at least in West LA where I am. And the, the most um, intuitive for me and the patients on the predict tool has been the icon view where you have a hundred circles and they're colored with, I saved three more people from ke with chemo, uh, 15 died of other causes. That tends to be the most uh, intuitive for them to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dirk? Yes, maybe one uh, small comment. Uh, for patients, I would more stress the additional benefit. Um, for doctors, I think the survival is important. And there's also cultural differences because I hear from my colleagues in the UK that patients really want to know what are my risk for cancer if they see a diagnosis of a uterine tumor. In Belgium, they will never ask for risk. So they will ask, do you think it's benign or is it malignant? So there's cultural differences. But here, yeah. I think in the end, it's quite confronting as a patient to see, well, I have a high grade uh, cancer and my survival is quite poor. On the other hand, what you want to stress here is the additional benefit of hormone therapy or chemotherapy. So I would highlight this for the patients. And I think for the caregivers, it's important to have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. So Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry, Adrian. Oh, sorry. Uh, Dirk makes a very interesting comment about the patients. And again, here, there's some people have very anti-chemotherapy ideas and the cardiotoxicity, the deaths, and a long-term ME-like syndrome is things that worry about. So if you could have a little box for uh, you know, death from side effects or other long-term effects and see how common it is, because there's a certain middle-class group of people who are anti-vaxxers as well, uh, not like the American anti-vaxxers who don't like any sort of therapy. And uh, this is what they're more worried about rather than the fact they've got a 10% chance of dying in the next five years. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you for all these suggestions. Wonderful. Nick, shall we go to the final? So um, do you agree with our approach to imputing patient information and displaying outputs? I think that this was discussed and I think maybe we can move to the next uh, box. So um, it's about ajutorium for patients as well as healthcare systems. So do you think tools like ajutorium could also help patients understand and discuss decisions with clinicians? And I guess you kind of discussed that. So maybe unless you have something to say, um, maybe we can move even further. Uh, we want to ask you something more specific. And this is, do you think that the survival curves are a reasonable way to present predictions to patients? And if not, how we best can communicate that inclusively risk of side effects? So one thing that um, Kelly mentioned is this visualization introduced by David Spiegelhalter with the different dots. And But do you have any other ways that you think we should portray this information to patients? Do you have any suggestions to us, any of you? This is the overall survival for a breast cancer patient, even if she has metastatic disease, is increasingly more nebulous. You can have a HER2 positive patient metastatic to the liver and she's going to live for another, you could keep her alive for 15 years or two years. It's very... It varies so much. For an ER positive patient, overall survival is going to be good, even if she's metastatic. She'll, it depends on her age, of course, but, but they tend to live for a very long time. So I think that in, in that circumstance, having a progression-free survival is also really important because if somebody has a triple negative breast cancer and recurs, she's going to be on chemo for the rest of her life. And that might actually affect her decision-making as well. 
Thank you very much. Um, I, I tell my patients all the time, I have one chance to cure you. And if you have metastatic disease, you're not curable. It's a big gamble. Um, so then I guess uh, this brings us to the final question. So how can tools like Ajutorium help support the delivery of end-to-end -end healthcare? And additionally, how can they interact with support and improving existing guidelines, protocols, and processes? And um, maybe, Jem, maybe you would like to start, given your knowledge of well, healthcare I mean, systems I mean, at the national level. Well, possibly, but I'm a pathologist, and I don't think I've seen a live patient in 30 years. Um, so I, I'm not sure how useful I am in sort of end-to-end -end healthcare. I can tell you what the end of it is. Um, well, but you are I, collecting I data and let's, well. let's, let's, let's look at guidelines. Um, I, I think guidelines are a challenge for anyone who's practicing because you know, they are exactly what they say they are. They're guidelines and no patient or relatively few patients actually fit them. And also guidelines take a long time to develop and new therapies come along and the world is changing around us. So you can be locked into guidelines and a lot then depends on, I think probably, again, the country you work in um, and how stringent people are on those guidelines and where the payer uh, provider split fits and whether you're allowed to drift from guidance and still get payment. So I think all of those things are complex. But again, a tool like Adjutorium, if you can get it adopted, I, I mean, the amount of work that's gone in to predict, to get it accepted, to get it approved by AJCC and NICE, and to have it endorsed by clinicians is very significant. I mean, you know, I've been involved in PREDICT since it first started. Um, and, you know, we went to Peter Ravden when we first started and looked to um, uh, adjuvant. Um, and, you know, it, it has taken those 15 years to get it so widely used. And just to hear Kelly and Selene say it's what we use every day, new tools come along all the time. And I think the biggest challenge Adjutorium has is getting it adopted, getting it accepted, overcoming the skepticism that there is around machine learning as an interpretation that is semi-black box um, and how it gets used. And I think those are the really big challenges that you face going forward. I would agree. Thank you so much. Adrian, Sileni, Kelly, any last minute uh, final comments or advice? and food for thought for, for, for us? Well, can you work in any way with PREDICT rather than being competitive, uh, you know, work together to, to you know, because they've got things like Chi-67 on it, uh, different types of chemotherapy on it, and more detail. So I just wonder whether that's... Uh, well, I mean, definitely, I guess we can use the data. And since our autoprognosis tool is a superset, if you like, it can combine both linear models like PREDICT as well as nonlinear models. Um, it's relatively easy to, 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 to join forces by, by sharing data and understanding how to combine these different models. And our framework autoprognosis does just that. So I guess... That may be a way forward. Sileni, Kelly, any last minute comments? I'm looking forward to the next version. <laughs> Thank you. Kelly? I think the most uh, in, important thing for me in choosing a regimen is just, it's going to be based on the biology, of course, and anything that can hone in on that to a more significant degree by incorporating oncotype or mammoprint or even percentage of ER positive. Um, because if you have a 20% ER positive breast cancer, that means the other 80% is kind of, it's not. So I think there's a lot of, uh, as we move more into using molecular biology to decide treatment plans, it's in the metastatic setting already. It's going to move into the adjuvant setting and just be ready for it. Thank you. So Ahmed and I are definitely very much looking forward to, to collaborate with you all and, and learn from your insights and, and build tools that can empower you. Um, thank you very much. So Nick. Yeah, um, so I think that's pretty much all we have time for today. But I would like to uh, remind you that basically anything you've seen, um, whether it's the presentations, whether it's the web app, 
um, whether it's the, the paper that featured in Nature, Machine Intelligence about Adjutorium, this is all available on our website. Um, so please do take a look at that. But to give you an idea of what's coming up next from these sessions. Um, so for our next session, uh, we still haven't really chosen a date for this. And I think we'll just think about how the basically the summer pla um, pans out. Um, and when we have chosen a date and a topic for this, we will keep you updated and we'll let you know ASAP. Um, this session you're watching now uh, can be found on YouTube just in a couple of days when I've edited and uploaded. So um, please have a look there or please have a look um, on our own website because it will be posted there as well. Um, also, in the meantime, if you are just looking for something else to read, uh, I would like to point you towards a new piece of content we have on interpretable machine learning for healthcare um, entitled um, Making Machine Learning Interpretable, a dialogue with clinicians, which actually builds on a previous um, revolutionizing healthcare roundtable that we actually had on interpretable ML. Uh, again, you can find that on our homepage, um, or you can just click big ideas on our website and it'll be like the first thing that pops up. Um, so for those of you who are interested in uh, getting CPD credits for attending these sessions, all you really need to do is just drop me an email at the address that you see here or the address that I've been using to send you uh, emails about these sessions. Um, please just let me know which sessions you've attended. Um, so you can claim credits either for sessions that you joined live or sessions that you joined via YouTube um, and for any session basically since December 2020. Um, so what I'll do is I'll issue a certificate that allows you to apply for your credits via the Royal College of Physicians website. Um, and that'll include codes for this session. Um, otherwise, uh, in the meantime, um, we would be very grateful if you could just let your friends and colleagues know about these sessions. Um, word of mouth is hugely important to us because we are trying to build a community here. So um, if you do know anyone who might be interested, please just send them um, to this link here um, that you can find on our website as well. That would be very much appreciated. But in the meantime, I guess until we see you next, uh, please take care and stay safe and very much looking forward to our next session. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye, everyone.